uh, an interest of mine for decades, literally decades. In fact, it goes back to an obsession with weather as a kid. Wow. Um, you know, that kind of morphed into an interest in uh, climate and climate change way back in the 70s when I started getting obsessed with ice ages and things like that. So, you know, I've had a little bit of study into the matter. So um, just enough, I would say, so that when I hear some of the various things being said out there, I have enough knowledge of the matter under discussion to realize that uh, it's a very slanted discussion at present. It's important to, to understand that the glaciers began receding in the early 18 to mid 1800s. And this was basically coinciding with the, the beginnings of uh, climate science, with the beginnings of geology, uh, the beginnings of um, a lot of science that was, that was occurring in the early 1800s. The Little Ice Age was a period that, that um, evolved over several phases. The first phase of it began um, in the early to mid-1300s. It was not uniform all over the world. In some places, it began sooner than at other places. In some places, it, it was more severe. But we can basically say that from about 13, early 1300s to the mid-1300s, the climate shifted fairly dramatically from what had uh, the previous three or four centuries that had been referred to as the medieval warm period. You basically have to flatten the curve. So that means you have to flatten out the medieval warm period. You have to make the medieval warm period cooler, and you have to make the Little Ice Age warmer. And this and is what you they're do doing. That, yeah, it goes from medieval warm period up here, Little Ice Age here, flattening it out like this, and then you stick um, basically instrumented records, at which are end. subjecting yeah. to yeah. adjustments, onto a proxy record. So that really the, the 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 blade of the hockey stick is the instrumental record, which has uh, a lot of uncertainties and questions about it. Like, uh, for example, we could talk about the uh, urban heat island effect and the failure to to account fully account for that in looking at the modern record. While you look for that slide, I'm going to read a yeah. read something from the IPCC in 2001. So this is 20 years ago now. Yep. And and this is what I don't get is how they can just flip flop. Uh, they can officially say one thing and then, you know, now they're just fear mongering constantly for the last 20 years. But it says in climate research and modeling, we should recognize that we are dealing with a coupled nonlinear chaotic system and mm -hmm. therefore that the long term prediction of future climate states is not possible. And there's a survey of these modelers and it shows that they tuning this tuning that they do to these models Mm -hmm. is often unavoidable but a dirty part of climate modeling. And this is right from the IPCC. All the rest of them, when you, when you look at it, I put it in the form of a graph here. And oh, there this we go, yeah. State high temperature records by decades. The last record set was Connecticut in 1995. In 2006, South Dakota tied its all-time record high up from 1936. As of November 2009, no state high temperature records have been broken for 14 years, and that still holds true today. All right, so if we go back, the time times 1,000 years, this is 400,000 years ago, okay. and this is the present. Now, okay. this is an older graph, but it's, it's, uh, and it's somewhat smooth because there are a lot of smaller oscillations that are not showing up in here, but the overall trends hold true. And what we see here is the troughs are basically full glacial ages, and the peaks are interglacial ages, such as we're in right now. And you can see that the, con that the climate here is constantly oscillating back and forth. But where it gets really interesting is when you take this graph and you go back to the uh, beginning of the Holocene, and then you extend it back a couple of hundred thousand years. Oh, yeah, years. that's oh, what boy. I want to see. Yeah. This is where it and gets crazy. You look at the magnitude of these climatic oscillations compared to what of the last 10,000 years. And yeah. Wow. So there were two extreme warming events. And um, so, yeah, the Baling Alarod was at about 15,000 years ago. Then there was this first warming spike, which was, uh, I would 
uh, <clears throat> conjecture um, that this was associated with the first great catastrophic melting episode of the great ice complexes that, that yielded the first uh, big mega flood events. Um, and then... See, at 11,600, here's the Younger Dryas, and then at 11,600 years ago is what we now consider the beginning of the Holocene. The right. idea that the elliptical shape of the Earth's orbit means that it's sometimes it's farther away from the sun. Like right now, the Earth is actually closer to the sun on January 2nd, right? So if, if it was reversed and the Earth was farther away from the sun on January 2nd, that means we'd have colder winters than we do now. And warmer summers. And then also the fact that, you know, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, there's more land relative to ocean. <laughs> this has, this has a, a, you know, because the land has a higher albedo than the ocean, it's going to be reflecting more. go on here. Here's two sets of CO2 concentrations in gas recovered from the bird ice core, also from Antarctica. And we go back again, here's your depth, your assigned age, 1,000 back to 40,000 years ago, right here. And here it shows the assumed fluctuation in the amount of carbon dioxide. Now, what's, what's really interesting here about this is when you look at this, you're looking here, over here, you're, you're looking at 20,000 years ago. You, you follow this over. You're looking at carbon dioxide down to 180 parts per million. Now, you know what happens at 180 parts per million? Basically, photosynthesis is, is in the process of shutting down. So here's, this was a study done from 1939 to 1941. The CO2 concentrations in Germany, and this is, this is based upon stomatal densities. And look here, here's your CO2 in parts per million, right? So now if you go back in days and decades, so this is basically the period of, of, of two years, right? And look at the concentrations of CO2 is not holding steady. It's quite dynamic. Mm. And then we actually look at this peak right here that would have occurred around 1940, come across 550 parts per million. Here's another uh, study um, based upon leaves that were dated from 1863 to 1864. This is in the Baltic Sea area. And again, what we see here is the carbon dioxide concentrations are fluctuating pretty wildly. And we see this peak up here is showing 400 parts per million, which supposedly we did not uh, exceed until within the last decade. But here it is showing back in 1863, 1864, that you've got numbers up there equivalent to what we assumed late 20, late 20th and early 21st century. And then the temperature graph in the bottom right-hand corner shows that it doesn't look like there's a correlation between temperature and CO2 levels? Yeah, this is the temperature of the IPCC, and this is showing at 1860 right here. And what you see here is your temperature is the blue, the blue line, and your carbon dioxide is the purple line. One thing that becomes apparent from studying this graph is this. Throughout the Pleistocene epoch on Earth, the period encompassing the, the past 2.6 million years of ongoing glacial ages, carbon dioxide concentrations have been at their lowest in all of Earth history since Precambrian times. Only since the end of the Great Ice Age, 11 to 12,000 years ago, did concentrations begin to rise from their depressed Pleistocene state. And only within the past century have they risen to more normal amounts when looked upon within the larger context of Earth history. When we talk about glacier recession, as it's going on now, our context is basically the last 100 years, 150 years. And our baseline is the Little Ice Age. And what he said in what Hubert Lamb said in 1981 has been confirmed over and over by subsequent studies that 
the, the mass of the Little Ice Age glaciers was probably the greatest on this planet in 10,000 years. So if we're going to be talking about, oh, let's measure, you know, reduction in, in glacier mass, but our baseline is going to be the most extensive mass increase of glacier ice on the planet in 10,000 years right there. You see how that begins to bias yep. our assumptions? Yeah. And I mean, it could, I could go on with this. I mean, I have, we've looked at what, a couple of dozen slides here. I have about 2,000 slides <laughs> addressing wow. various aspects of the climate question. see as the, the 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 tie that binds when it comes to the climate change agenda whether it be cop 21 the paris accord you know the paris climate agreement as they like to put it agenda 21 agenda 2030 coming out of the united nations the the common denominator in all this is something called technocracy um, that one of those tankers, just one, produces more CO2 than every single car on the planet. <laughs> wow. I mean, when you just take that into account, that's why I say you're here, then you got your, your, your corporations. And especially in this globalist environment, when we have these international shipping tankers creating more CO2 than every car on the planet, just one, and they're hundreds if not thousands of these crossing the pacific every day um they create ship tracks these are these are chemtrails granddaddy um these are basically clouds that come off of sh these international ships that are 50 100 miles wide and sometimes three to ten thousand miles long i see four main factors in this ruin the ocean, kill trees, kill bacteria, artificial clouds, and finally, geoengineering. The important factor, the most important thing on the planet is human resources, um, controlling all the humans. But the, the second most important thing on the planet is water resources, because water is life. And if you can control water, or as Lyndon Baines Johnson, our president, said, he who controls the weather controls the world. Um, that was back in the 60s. So, you know, th this is long in the planning, um, you know, of these these uh, technocrats and bureaucrats. Um, uh, this is a friend of mine from MIT University, Dr. Rick Shankman. He put out an article called Genetically Modified Weather, the Tale of Frost Band Synthetic Bacteria. And it was also known as Ice Minus Pseudomonas. And then we have the problem of accidental geoengineering. And this is a shot from Climate Viewer 3D, which is climateviewer.org, my 3D map. Um, you can bring up the satellite um, imagery for every day all the way back to like 2002. And you can see these very long lines in here. And these are the ship tracks. And all of this creates what's called marine stratocumulus. And these clouds basically blanket the entire Pacific Ocean. If the time and place of seeding is selected with care, the climate effect of cirrus thinning can be enhanced. For that, only long wave warming effects of cirrus clouds should be targeted, and their solar effects should be avoided. Now, I'm going to translate this, so don't, don't trip out. Um, this can be achieved if seeding is limited to high latitude winters or to nighttime seeding. This is, the, this is what's going on today. Um, all behind, you know, closed doors. Um, the last one I'll throw you is from the ICAO Colloquium on Aviation and Climate Change 2010. Um, and Dr. Ulrich uh, Schumann, the world's top expert on chemtrails, contrails, plane farts, he said, we want less warming and more cooling contrails predictable for operational planning. Oh, my God. That just scared so, to me. This is not this is not conspiracy theory. These are straight out of the mouths of scientists 
interviewing the head of the FAA. I didn't pull these from conspiracies. I pulled these from Google Scholar. And then I started asking questions and I started digging into the data and realizing that what was going on, what was being reported by the press and by government agencies like NASA and NOAA, in no way resembled reality. That, that this, there, was a, a, there was a narrative being generated and it was based on fake data, altered data. And I've been, so I've been pursuing that story for the past 13 years that I've been blogging about for the past 13 years and collecting more and more data. I've done probably 100,000 blog posts and several thousand videos and countless Twitter tweets. And um, it, the story is just nothing like what you hear in the press and nothing like what we hear from our governments. The reality of what's going on with climate is a completely different story. So my father was a phys nuclear physicist at Los Alamos, and he started complaining in, in the 1960s that everything was becoming very political. When he first got to Los Alamos, he said it was great. They would give him money. They could go off and do whatever they, crazy ideas they wanted, and they were basically left alone. But then I, I think in the 1960s, we had the senator... William Proxmire from Wisconsin, and he realized he could make a name for himself by um, finding bogus government projects, you know, you know, government science projects, which sounded like they were a waste of money. And so he created this Golden Fleece Award. And so then Congress got very heavily involved with science, and it became very political. This is a, a paper that was written by um, James Hansen, the guy at NASA who started the Global Warming Scare before Congress in 1988. It's a paper he wrote in 1999, and the graph on the left was his U.S. temperature graph in 1999, and it showed that the United States, the warmest year was 1934, and that the United States had cooled rather significantly. And he was very concerned about this. He wrote about it in this, in this paper. Paper, he couldn't understand why the United States wasn't warming like it was supposed to, according to his climate models. So he did the obvious thing, which government scientists always did. He just changed the data. <laughs> and this is NASA. official, yeah, official NASA graph, right? Right, yeah. right, from 1999, published by none other than James Hansen, the same guy who was making the predictions. And he was very upset that the United States was cooling. This was 1934, the hottest year, and this is 1998, which was, um, you know, which was a warm year, but it was cooler than 1934 and 1921. And, you know, which was a century ago and several other years. So he, he was very upset. He couldn't understand what was going on. Yeah, so he, they raised the heat of the 1930s, made 1934 cooler than 1998, and it created this warming trend, which doesn't exist. It's, it's completely fake data, right? It's so what people, when people look at these graphs from the government, they think, wow, NASA, that's the... Those are the people who took us to the moon, right? And they say that we're heating up out of control. But it's all fake. It's not actual data. And But if we look at the actual data um, from Oxford University of global deaths from natural disasters by decade, they're down 90% from 100 years ago. Wow, 20 is bad. Spite, yeah, this is despite the fact that the world's population has tripled in that time. So there's been a huge decrease in the number of deaths uh, by natural disasters. So we keep hearing that there's a climate crisis. Someone tweeted me this morning, 300,000, the United Nations says that 300,000 people a year are dying from climate change. But if you look at the actual numbers. Well, look at, look at the blue on that. If you just focus on the blue, look at what happened since yeah. the 20s. The blue went down in the 40s, which is drought, went down in the yeah. 60s, went down in the 80s to almost nothing. Um, so here, here's another gra important graph, right? This is the world population in living in extreme 
poverty. It's plummeted over the last 200 years, and particularly since 1950. You know, when I was a kid, you know, there were tens of millions of people starving to death in India and China. Now we're not seeing that. So the quality of life has greatly improved for people around the world. That would not be what you'd expect to see from this climate crisis they claim is occurring. This was the graph from the National Interagency Fire Center as of um, six weeks ago. For It was the history of burn acreage in the United States going back to 1926. And you can see there was a lot more burn acreage in the United States prior to 1960. In recent years, have been fairly small. Um, and in, in this Washington Post article from a few years ago, what they did was they hit all the data before 1960 to make it look like there was been an increase in fires, even though the trend was actually way down. So this is where the data starts now in 1983. <laughs> So by doing this, uh, and, and so this is the, I marked in pink here the data which has been deleted by the Biden administration in the last six weeks, right? So I mean, how can they get away with that, really? I mean, that is, it is, this should be taken more serious by people. I mean, I just don't understand how they, well, they can well, do I've this. Been, I've, I've been exposing this sort of fraud for more than a decade. The press just censors me, right? They they would. They're oh yeah, I mean, you've been scam, attacked right? by all kinds of people too. I mean, you got these skeptics going after you, saying, "Oh, you know, they're rebuttals to you." And I, I don't know what they what they even have. How, you use official data m most of the time, I believe, oh, right? Yeah, that's all I use is official data and trusted newspaper sources like the New York Times. <laughs> these are some graphs. This is from National Geographic in 1976, and they showed how Earth had warmed up a lot in 1940, then it cooled down and lost all of its heat. But they also showed for the past 10,000 years that Earth was much warmer during the Holocene Optima, which I mentioned yeah. before. Yeah. The Arctic was ice-free um, around the time Stonehenge was built. And temperatures I mean, look at the cooled. last 850. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the last, this graph is for the past thousand years. They showed that Earth was very warm around, you know, a thousand years ago. Then we had this warm period in the 1940s, and then and then it cooled dramatically after that. Well, that cooling has been erased, as has been all, all the whole scene, the optimum has been erased in the last six weeks by Michael Mann, who also erased the medieval warm period. In, the, in the last six weeks, literally? Like, he's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, there's been lots of discussion in the past six weeks since Biden became president oh. that there wasn't really a Holocene optimal <laughs> that that all of this warm weather didn't exist. Right? Um, this is Michael Mann's hockey stick. He got rid of the medieval warm period. He got rid of the little ice age and created this hockey stick oh of warming, my God. which included deleting. Most of this was based on proxy data, like from tree rings, but he deleted the inconvenient data after 1940 because it didn't show what he wanted it to show, so he just got rid of it. <laughs>